Hey, so I'm gonna do just another World War One video that I'm planning to, I'll edit it and put a slideshow, but for right now, I'm just kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm just uploading before I edit for now because I don't have that many videos up and I wanna have stuff to organize, but eventually it'll be, I'll be putting out videos where, you know, when I'm talking about the Hindenburg line, I'll probably have a diagram and all that kind of stuff, like maps and things, because Here's what this video, here's what this World War One series is about, okay guys? If you really want to know about World War One, I, I don't think there's, personally, I don't think there's any better way than the Great War series or that uh, the podcast series by the, the historian podcaster, forget his name. But in pr my personal opinion, the way that Indy Nidell does it on the Great War channel, he goes week by week, and they did the 100-year anniversary, so every episode was released exactly 100 years after the events. So it started in, 20, in 2014 and ended in 2018. And you get a complete picture of World War I. You'll know everything, pretty much. Everything worth knowing. But this series is more for people who don't want to put in that time, and they kind of want to just get the high-level impressions that I got from watching every episode. And it's been a little, the reason why, like, you know, I wait, it's been like two years because I want to give people what they're actually going to remember anyway, even if they were, watch all the things. Because, you know, you don't remember every detail and guy. So, so yeah, this is basically just to save some time by getting like a high level breakdown of World War One, as well as zooming in on some of the really interesting aspects and misconceptions. So with that, first misconception. All right, we got, we got the whole casualty thing and how many men died and how many were brutalized with the statistics. When you're reading military statistics, for people who are just getting into like reading about military stuff, because it's pretty cool, especially the tactics, you have to remember that, especially in World War I, like there's a difference between dead and casualties and in a world in a war like world war one it's a massive difference except for in some of the battles like the early ones when they were just getting mowed down by machine guns and those were horrible but when you see casualties in the millions for a really long battle it's because men if you get trench foot you're a casualty if you get dysentery you're a casualty if you get your limb blown off, you're a casualty. If you lose your fingers, you're a casualty. You can't fight as well. You can't really, it, it's just when the, when the soldier loses combat effectiveness, they're a casualty, especially if it's permanent. So, um, yeah, so even if you're shelled to hell, you get shell shock, you, you can't fight, you're just shaking. I think that that would be kind of a temporary one, but the other big factor and the reason why a lot of not as many men died as you think is because of prisoners. A lot of men were taken prisoner because men don't fight when they don't have a chance anymore unless it's a really bad war. But World War One, the guys didn't really hate each other that much. The two sides barely even. They were just like, oh yeah, you're fighting, I'm fighting. You can read about the Christmas truce. Like, they liked each other. They were friends. But it was like, well, too bad, you know. <laughs> we got to fight now. So it was, it's kind of sad because it was the higher ups, uh, the, um, you know, like the aristocracy that was doing these wars and wanted them. And the men listened and gave their lives, but it meant that they had chronic morale problems through the whole war. There were morale issues, especially for the French, ironically enough. But they, not to they didn't want to they weren't willing to die as bad as like you know the guys on Iwo Jima in World War II so they were much easier to take prisoner hundreds of thousands of prisoners over the war so another thing is the gas right it's like oh the gas killed everyone in World War I no way gas almost killed hardly anyone died of gas and and hard, for the same reason that hardly anyone died of flamethrowers those weapons are meant to terrorize and force a retreat because if you do stay in it, you know, they turn on the flamethrower, launch the gas, and like three or four guys, or maybe three dozen guys, they die horribly in agony. And so the rest of the men flee, whereas if you just shelled them, they would have still been there. 
And then the other problem with the gas is that if the wind blows, it, it'll come back onto your trench, your own trench. And if the wind doesn't blow, you can't really do anything anyway because your men can't go in there either. If it's like mustard gas, like the skin stuff. And then if it's inhaler gas, then you can, it only works if the other side doesn't have their gas mask on. So gas was very, very specific to situations. It wasn't like every battle was just filled with gas. And it also, like flamethrowers, like they hardly killed anyone, but if you want to just take a position, you, you got that, you use stuff like that. So you have to kind of understand that war is hugely about psychology. That's why men would attack sometimes because you just can't handle never getting back at them. They're always coming at you and taking your trench and killing your guys and robbing your house, taking your food. And the guys lose their own morale if it's like, why are we always the ones sitting back? And so you would attack just for the sake of attack. Even though the men are going to die, they would rather do it just because they want to get some of that oorah going. They need some oorah. The, the other side's getting it all day, and all they get to do is be the victim. Even if they lose like 30% less men, it's still like, well, we want to hit them. So, you know, there's a lot of human psychology involved because the commanders, especially in wars that the men don't care about as much, they really have to make the psychological situation tolerable. And in World War I, a lot of the times it wasn't. So like at Verdun, Verdun happened before the French, I think, or yeah, before the French had implemented troop rotations, fast ones. Because in old times you would be like, you'd fight for like two or three months, like a whole fighting season, because most of the time you're just trekking. So the French had it at like, they still had it really long. And there were men, guys. You you want to think about you want to think about like warriors, like what it was like. For some of the some of the some of the hardest war experience ever. I think one of the hardest is to be one of the men who was at Verdun for like a month straight without any relief or rotation. All battle, all the time, all day. Shells, shells, shells. Shoot, shoot, shoot for a month, like. I bet they were casualties. I would suspect they couldn't fight that much after that. They were probably just broken. So after that, the French started doing what the Germans had already been doing, rotating their troops like every week or two weeks so that, you know, it'll break you, but not in two weeks totally. And you can read All Quiet on the Western Front if you want to get a sense of that, how it's like hell and then you're chill for a while, drinking with the boys. And then hell, and then you're chill. And the men needed that to look forward to. Yeah, so you kind of start to understand war better when you look at the human psychology. I'll just do some other quick takeaways um, just to get a feel of what other videos I could do. Um, uh, the Austro-Hungarians' complete ineptitude is incredible and how many men died just because of the ineptitude. The, the Brusilov Offensive, Russians against the Austrians, is one of the most glorious, like, the, the, like General Brusilov's offensive. He had more glory during that offensive than almost any warrior has ever had. It was a beautiful, it was beautiful. It's just like art. With more running away than just pure death, like war is pretty strategic, and then the other side dies when they lose their strategy. It's really bad battles, like, like huge naval battles where every man on the ship dies. Like that's when stuff gets really gnarly. And of course, whenever a battle, whenever one side loses bad enough, if you get surrounded, for example, but at least in World War I, there was a good amount of prisoner taking on the West. And another thing that I w you wanna know going in is that the static trench warfare, we think that World War I was like that, but it wasn't. It was just a Western Front, and there's reasons for that. I can go into it, like the Schieffen plan, and then all that, the race to the sea. So it was only super static on the Western Front and in the Alps, kind of. But the Eastern Front was wide open. There weren't that many trenches. It was, it's so much to land and flat land that you know, they were just fighting old school where you've got lines going and lines retreating and it's very not, not static, really. So, and then same in Turkey, 
in the in the um, you know there was fighting between the Turks and the the Ottomans and the Russians in the Caucasus. So you, you know there's like so many fronts, so many fronts. You got Arabia, you got like Egypt and Lebanon. You got Gallipoli. God, we got to do Gallipoli. Gallipoli campaign is one of the most. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He's probably going to be one of the heroes in the series, despite his sins. He had sins. But I've been to his house where he lived in Thessaloniki, Greece. You have to know about Mustafa Kemal Ataturk because he was one of the, he was the dude who defended at Gallipoli. And not only that, but Turkey didn't get its borders drawn. Despite losing, the Ottoman Empire lost and all the Middle East got its borders drawn by the French. Like they made Iraq and then the British made Israel and stuff like that. So Ataturk, not only did he beat them at Gallipoli, but just because of him, he managed to win what's known as the Turkish War of Independence. And that's why Turkey, it's like, that's why, that's one of the reasons why there isn't a Kurdistan is because Turkey had, well, has like a third of what would be Kurdistan, Kurdistan. And Ataturk was just like, I'm going to kick your ass. Screw you. You can't take that. And he actually did it. And you, it, it's beautiful. If you want to learn, like, his beautiful, like, beautiful. He, he, was, he, was, he was so good. You have to know thy enemy. You have to follow the art of war by, by Lu Tzu. You have to be educated. You have to know the wars. You have to know how things have gone down, what other societies are going to do. You have to know the psychology of your enemy generals. Are they, or what are they likely to do? And then you just, you know, you go and you inspire your men so they fight harder. Just cool things that, like, lesser known facts. Stuff that's like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, you know, there's a lot more, but I think that this is good enough to kind of just get, like, an intro sense of the direction that these series are going to be going. Um, yeah, so it's really cool. And... You learn a lot of things about outcomes, too, like the Russians and the Germans and how the Bolsheviks had ran on ending the war. And the Germans knew that. So they made this horrible deal that got overwritten at Versailles. But like, you know, it's just crazy things that you learn, like Vladimir Lenin used German weapons to take over his country, which is pretty much treason pretty well. And then surrendered to the Germans and gave them almost everything. It's like, was he just a German agent or fighting for Russia? Well, his argument's that, well, the war is horrible and what's it going to do? It's never going to end. I would say at this point, it's, there, there's a sunk cost fallacy kind of, but it affects outcomes. You have to keep fighting because Germany's going to lose from the West. They're doomed. So you just have to keep fighting until they come to the table. Which is what happened anyway at Versailles. So you can kind of look at it like, well, we let them have Ukraine and stuff for a couple of years, but at least we didn't lose a bunch of men for when there was Versailles anyway. So, you know, it's just decisions. Um, I can do a video on Rasputin. It's kind of, there's kind of just, if you, when you read about Rasputin, don't read about his later life. Well, read about, learn about his later life, but there's not that many videos on his early life when he was a spiritual mystic who believed in myth, myth, mystical healing. You have to, um, you know, that guy went from nothing, a rural peasant, to basically the, the, the real husband of the Tsarina. In one lifetime, there's, Rasputin was weird. Rasputin was something special. You can look into his eyes, watch some videos of him. He was different. So, so many interesting characters in history. Tsar Nicholas is a hell interesting. Um, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky. Wow, you know. And during this era, you know, um, there's a lot of stuff going down. So, yeah. Cool. We'll start with that. I'll edit it eventually, some slides, or just keep this one no slides and then just make new ones and edit them. So, cool.